Okay, well thank you, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. I will be uh, talking about this, this new book called uh, Educating for the Anthropocene, uh, Spooling and Activism in the Face of Slow Violence, uh, which will be coming out uh, next, next month. Um, and because I know that uh, perhaps not everyone has uh, come across the term Anthropocene or is, is very familiar with it, I want to first spend a little bit of time uh, talking about the Anthropocene. Uh, because it's, it's quite, uh, quite a complicated concept uh, in, in some ways. A, a very simple way to think about the Anthropocene is in its original disciplinary context, which is geology. So geologists uh, divide history of the planet into these periods, um, right? So you can see, you know, counting in millions of years, uh, we can divide the sediments of the Earth um, based on the environmental changes and the kinds of things that got sedimented in the, in the planet. And the idea is that uh, this last period called the Holocene, which started at the uh, end of the last ice age when the glaciers melted about 13,000 years ago, uh, has now come to an end and that the Anthropocene has begun as the new era, the new geological era, the new geological period, which means that basically we'll have to update our science textbooks to reflect this new, this new reality. Um, the idea is that when a new era starts, there is always uh, a significant change in the environment. So, for example, um, at the beginning of the Paleocene, 65 million years ago, that's when an asteroid fell on the planet and killed the dinosaurs as well as many other species. So that was obviously a very big event. So the Anthropocene basically signifies uh, another shift, another big shift in the environment of the planet where we, the humans, are the asteroids, right? We are the ones who are actually changing uh, the face of the planet in, in such a way that if millions of years from now aliens were to land on, on Earth, they would actually find traces of us in the geological record. Uh, so anthropo, human, human beings being the main uh, kind of actor uh, on, on the planet in terms of the environment. Uh, you also see the expression slow violence in the title of the lecture and the, of the book. This is actually a term that I'm borrowing from um, the environmental humanities scholar Rob Nixon, who wrote a book called Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, in which he argues that um, environmental change is, um, we can think of environmental change as a form of slow violence. So it is a violence that's being perpetuated on the planet, um, but it is slow. It's, it's oftentimes not easily perceptible. It's not something we can notice Sometimes even in the span of a person's life, we won't necessarily notice what is happening. So um, we need to uh, think of slow violence in different ways from the way that we think of fast violence, which is the kind of violence that you might see in everyday news, um, in order to be able to understand and conceptualize it. So that, that sort of hypothesis or that argument is something that I am, uh, I'm building on in this, um, in this work. Um, I quite like to share this quote when I talk about the Anthropocene because it's deliberately provocative. Uh, the idea that um, the biggest challenge is philosophical, understanding that the civilization has already ended, that this, this world that we live in, in many ways, is a Holocene world. It's a world which um, hasn't yet adopted to this idea of human beings being such a significant um, influence on, on the planet, on the very chemistry and physics of the, of the planet, and that we actually need some kind of a new civilization, that we need some kind of a big uh, cultural, political, social shift that corresponds to this, to this change. Um, and so really wrapping our head around that, uh, this idea that we are living in a civilization that has already died, that is unsustainable, um, can feel quite depressing, but I think it can also feel quite, quite liberating because it allows us to get quite creative about how we think about, uh, how we think about the future. Now, the Anthropocene, obviously, as a term in geology, is not really the way that I'm using the term. Uh, I'm not a geologist, I'm not a natural scientist, I'm, a, I'm an anthropologist, I'm a social scientist. So I like to think of the Anthropocene more as an ideology or as a, as a kind of cultural phenomenon and thinking about how did this actually happen that we um, have started this new, this new era. I don't think anyone ever really made a decision consciously that that's what we want to do. So, you know, thinking about how did our culture and how did our politics arrive at this point where we have, um, as, a, as a civilization, uh, become such a big influence on, on the environment. When you look at the literature on the Anthropocene, uh, there are several themes. Um, 
in terms of these political and cultural origins of, of this phenomenon. One is masculinity, thinking about the kind of masculinist project of domination over the earth and um, almost, uh, you know, kind of wrestling control from nature, right? That there's something, there's something masculinist about that logic. Um, also the ideology of science, the idea that we can actually grasp everything through science, that we can, we can have a full understanding of what is happening and be fully in control because of our scientific method and our scientific knowledge. So masculinist ways of thinking, scientist, scientistic ways of thinking. But also uh, the history and presence, you could say, of colonialism. Uh, this idea of colonizing spaces for extraction, uh, colonizing nature uh, in order to extract from nature, seeing, seeing nature as uh, a space to be colonized, as a space to, to extract from. Uh, but there's also an interesting strand of scholarship uh, in the discussion about the Anthropocene that talks about the history of the Cold War. And this idea that during the Cold War we had the polarization of the world uh, between these, these two camps, as well as the non-aligned countries. And the, this competition, uh, in, in many ways, actually is responsible for what some scholars uh, refer to as the great acceleration after World War II, the great acceleration of um, consumption, of extraction, of consumerism, of economic activity, uh, and ultimately, you know, the period that gave rise to the current unsustainable way of life. Um, and that this, this competition, uh, this idea that nations have to compete with one another, they have to kind of show primacy over one another in, in some tangible material way, actually is partly responsible for the uh, rise of the Anthropocene. Now, in this book uh, where I theorize the Anthropocene and try to apply that theorization to education specifically, I also propose several other uh, ways that we can think about the Anthropocene that maybe haven't been uh, discussed in the literature as much. So extractivism I have already mentioned, uh, speciesism I think is another one, where we think of human species as being morally, ethically superior and of all other species basically as disposable. Um, but also these last two points really are the ones that um, I'm, I'm looking at in some detail and that perhaps haven't been discussed as much previously. One is ageism, uh, so the idea that um, we think of certain generations and people of a certain age as the ones who decide on the future of the world, right? That, uh, that there are certain, certain um, age groups, namely the so-called adults, who um, ultimately take decisions and are responsible for what the future looks like. Uh, we don't think of younger generations, of, of you know, young people, people who are actually in education, uh, necessarily as citizens or as political beings or, or people who have some kind of political agency. Um, and as we shall see later in the presentation where I talk about the work that I did with young people about their imaginations of environmental futures, their imaginations of what the future should look like actually oftentimes are quite different from the imagination of the adults. So I think there's something about the Anthropocene uh, that ideologically is also linked to this idea of age and exclusion based on age. And finally, this idea of social polarization, uh, which is actually a, a theme that continues from my, from my first book, uh, Visions of Development, uh, where I talked about this idea that when we, when we think about visions of development, we oftentimes have a so-called elite, uh, which designs the vision for development or designs the blueprint for the future. And then we have the so-called masses, uh, the people who are imagined to carry out that blueprint or to carry out uh, that, that future. And I think in the Anthropocene, as an ideological phenomenon, we can very much see this idea of social polarization, uh, again, linked to ageism, where we are very much handing down notions of the future to the younger generations and expecting them to um, carry out those visions or those, those blueprints, again, creating a kind of polarization between the ones who designed the blueprints and the ones who are expected to carry them out. So that's the kind of uh, ideological landscape. Now, one more thing I should say before I, before I move to the next part of the presentation is that the concept of the Anthropocene has been contested, it has been criticized on many different grounds, um, not least because uh, it, it basically homogenizes people, it kind of puts humanity into a single category and seems to suggest that we are all equally responsible when we of course know that some parts of the world are much more responsible for the environmental crisis than other parts of the world. 
Um, it's also been criticized uh, as a kind of colonial uh, notion, again, linked to this homogenization. Um, and I think all of those critiques are completely fair, and there are um, alternative terms that have been proposed. Uh, for example, some people use the term Anglocene to refer to the uh, historical responsibility of the English-speaking world for environmental change. Um, or um, some people use the term capitalocene, you know, to, to refer to specifically to capitalism as an economic system being responsible for these, for these uh, changes. Um, and I think all of those debates are completely fair. Uh, I personally stick to the word uh, Anthropocene simply because I think it conveys the magnitude of change and the stakes you know, that are so very high. Um, I think those other terms that tend to focus on uh, responsibility uh, maybe, maybe sort of move away the focus from the magnitude and the scale of the issue, which is why personally I still prefer, in spite of its problematic nature, to stick to um, the Anthropocene. Okay, so now uh, let me switch the gears a little bit and start talking about how all of this links to education. Um, the sort of original research question that I asked myself in this project was what is education's responsibility for the onset of the Anthropocene, but also for its, for its future? Um, when we look at the kind of policy context of all of this, uh, specifically the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 4.7, uh, you know, it's very clear that uh, education is envisioned as um, a tool as a, as a way to bring about a more sustainable future. Uh, specifically, we are talking about people living sustainable lifestyles, uh, you know, essentially moving away from the lifestyles of today into some kind of lifestyles that are going to be different. So it's almost as if we are envisioning education as some kind of a tool for social engineering, where you know, we, we expect that education is going to get us out of trouble in terms of the environmental crisis. Um, in reality, uh, when you look at the, the literature and the research that has been done on environmental and sustainability education and how this idea of molding a more sustainable future through education plays out in practice, um, there is a, um, a lot of critique that has been written over the years um, around the kind of depoliticization that happens in the context of um, sustainability uh, sort of approach through education, formal education systems. Um, so, for example, in a, in a piece written, you know, 18, 17 years ago now, um, Smith was arguing about this idea of good environmental citizens and the idea that a good environmental citizen is, um, you know, someone who is essentially following those blueprints, following the rules, um, not questioning too much uh, the, the sort of wider systems of extraction, consumption, infinite growth, um, transnational capitalism, and basically is just going to comply with the kinds of actions that they are being asked to do, you know, such as recycling plastics or planting trees or, you know, these kinds of uh, oftentimes quite tokenistic actions that even if everyone was, was engaging in them wouldn't necessarily solve the problem. Uh, so I think this idea of so-called good environmental citizens is, is really worth um, thinking about when we think about SDG 4.7. Uh, and you know what does formal education um, actually actually contribute to? Um, I'm going to read this this quote in full because I find it quite um, quite illuminating. In the context of neoliberal sustainability, the responsibilities we are called on to exercise involve little out of the ordinary: drive a few miles less, recycle plastic containers, compost organic waste, and so on. These acts are in fact largely apolitical in an Arendtian sense. They usually do not initiate anything new or offer any real possibility for the individual to change the world. Rather, they become a means for ameliorating some of modernity's excesses. So I'm going to talk about Hannah Arendt and Hannah Arendt's theory of action uh, in, a, in a little bit. Um, but I, I find that this is actually quite a good sort of framework uh, for thinking about sustainability and education. Is this actually offering something new? Is this actually empowering the individual to somehow contribute to, to molding a different future? or not? Is it simply just continuing in someone else's, someone else's blueprint? Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to come back to this, um, but what I would like to, to link this conversation to now is the kind of empirical um, findings of the research um, behind, behind this book, um, which is really the part where I was trying to work with young people themselves to understand how they make sense of slow violence, how they make sense of environmental change, and ultimately what kind of uh, future they, they imagine. 
So I'm just going to walk you through this research project through, um, through a series of photographs, uh, just to show you, uh, to try and give you a little bit of, a, of the feel for, for what the research was, was really about. The research was in uh, multi-sided ethnography, uh, undertaken in a research site in South Africa, in South Durban. Um, South Durban uh, is a uh, area with some of the highest industrial levels of pollution in the world. Um, it's an area where 10% of South Africa's GDP originates because the largest port in Africa is located there. All the shipping and a lot of industries that are located near the port are, are, are built here. And some of the historians um, of South Africa actually argue that this is really where apartheid originated. Um, because when you, when you have this industrial zone, you need to have cheap labor that you can bring in. And especially in the early 20th century, when uh, pollution was rampant, and there, were very, there was very little in, in the way of um, mitigating the pollution. Uh, it, was, it was only the poorest people, who were the people of color, who were um, basically willing to live uh, near those industries because they didn't really have much of a choice. And so you end up with this kind of a segregation where the government is basically allocating areas of the most polluted places for people of color to live and then essentially become uh, disposable labor for these for these industries and then this then became a sort of blueprint for other cities of apartheid South Africa uh, that's anyway it's one of one of the ways to think about the origins of apartheid there are other ones but um, that's the one that's relevant for for this project um, the other research site was in Uttarakhand uh, in, in northern India uh, and it's one of the one of the rehabilitation sites for Terry Dam uh, Terry Dam displaced about 100,000 people. The specific rehabilitation site that I was looking at um, is called Pashulok. Uh, it's uh, in, in Uttarakhand, a uh, sort of very urban stretch of land near, near Rishikesh. Um, so this is, this is the Terry Dam, uh, really the biggest, the biggest Indian dam built in this century. Uh, this is what Pashulok uh, looks like. So you can see it's a kind of urbanizing, not quite yet urban, but sort of urbanizing um, area. Uh, this is the school um, where, I, where I did my field work in, in Pashwalk. It's actually located inside a shopping center. Um, so the government never actually built a school uh, in, this, in this area. Uh, so the school is just sort of squatting in a, in a few of the, the shop units on the, on the second floor. Um, and doesn't have, doesn't have any kind of a permanent, uh, permanent structure. Um, this is the view from the corridor from the school in South Africa, in South Durban, uh, where, I, where I did my research. Uh, you can see these, um, these smokestacks. Uh, that is South Africa's biggest um, oil refinery, which uh, is notorious for its environmental impact and is built you know, immediately next to residential dwellings and there are other schools also in the, in the area. Um, so the you know, rates of lung cancer, thyroid cancer, asthma, Many of, many of the diseases caused by air pollution are um, skyrocketing in, in South Durban in, in this specific school where uh, I, did my, I did my research. Uh, you know, the, the ambulance comes usually at least once a week to pick up at least one of the students uh, because they have an asthma fit or you know, some kind of a health issue that requires uh, sort of emergency treatment, uh, almost always linked to respiratory conditions. Uh, so this really is a, a sort of toxic soup, you know, that um, that people are, are living in here. You can see children playing soccer um, oops, uh, right again immediately next to the, the oil refinery. Um, and the oil refinery hasn't really been uh, sort of upgraded since the 70s. So the technology is very old um, and it is much more. There was a study that was actually done comparing this oil refinery with um, some of the oil refineries in, in Denmark, which are owned by the same conglomerate. Um, as, as this one, and uh, found huge disparities in terms of the, the levels of pollution released uh, by the two refineries. Uh, this is just another picture of a uh, sort of township uh, area that the research took, took place in. Now, in, in the course of the research, in trying to understand uh, how young people made sense of the environment and environmental futures, uh, I used a lot of methods from visual anthropology, uh, visual methods. Uh, one of the methods uh, had to do with imagining the world 100 years ago and imagining the world 100 years from now. And basically drawing these, these pictures uh, where children would uh, try to convey their imagination of those two different points in time uh, to really, uh, to really kind of have a starting point for a conversation. So 
So rather than kind of relying on interviews or more kind of standard qualitative methods, I felt these, these visual methods, uh, you know, sort of become data in themselves, but they also become a kind of point of departure and then having a conversation. Um, so here's a, here's a picture of an imagined future by a 12-year-old in South Africa, so the future, you know, 100 years from now. Uh, so you, know, you, can, you can see this child clearly is quite distressed about the state of the world. Um, and I think it's, it's quite interesting that you, know, you, see, um, you see specifically you know, you, the, the tree um, as you know, kind of being, being uprooted and taken out. Um, that there is, there's a particular concern about, about the natural environment uh, in, in this. Uh, here's another uh, drawing also, also from South Africa. Uh, sort of more conceptual, you could say, but very, very telling, I, I thought. Um, when, you, when you look at the drawings of the, of the past, I mean, they, they do tend to present um, a future, you know, which is or the, the, a reality, you know, a sort of reality of, of life, which is uh, much more hopeful in many ways. And you do see a kind of uh, tendency to have a lot more natural elements. And, you know, you could say maybe this is some kind of romanticization of the past, maybe this is some kind of romanticizing of indigenous lifestyles and, and so on. But what was really interesting to me was that when we actually started uh, looking at these, at these drawings with the children and talking about them in, in interviews and in group discussions, um, what, what became really clear was that uh, when I asked them to talk to me about which of the elements from the two drawings, the past drawing and the future drawing, they would actually like to bring into the future. So not to talk about the future as they think it will be, but as they think it should be, right? So kind of like their own personal future. Uh, you know, which elements from each drawing would they, would they bring in? It became really interesting that they were actually picking elements from both. And they didn't want to uh, kind of pursue the kind of future that they thought was, was going to come. They also didn't want to return to how life was 100 years ago. Uh, they, they were basically incorporating elements from, from both, of these, uh, both of these sort of visions in kind of molding their own their own future, uh, which you know I found I found really really quite quite interesting. And the other method that I that I used uh, was uh, documentary observational filmmaking. Uh, it's a it's a method that was developed by the Australian anthropologist uh, David McDougall, uh, who believes that there is a kind of inherent gap between generations, and that when we talk to young people, uh, we can't fully grasp their reality just by kind of verbal expression. Um, and that we need some kind of a different medium uh, to serve as a kind of intergenerational bridge. So he, he came up with this idea of observational filmmaking, uh, where the researcher basically introduces the technology, teaches the, the young people how to use the technology, but then pretty much steps back. So you know, the, the young people take the equipment home, they keep it for several months, they keep filming, uh, whatever it is that they find interesting. The only kind of condition that David McDougall puts on this is that the equipment should be of a sort of fairly professional level. So it shouldn't be a smartphone, it shouldn't be kind of a, a simple, easy to use camera. It should be the equipment that's deliberately kind of difficult to operate. And that's because when you, when you use that kind of equipment, uh, it makes the children uh, really focus on what it is that they're doing. Uh, so, you know, if they have to kind of set the shot each time, uh, you know, they have to set the focus on the white balance and just check the sound volumes, they can't just press the record button. There's a sort of series of technical decisions that, that go into uh, shooting each time that they, that they start filming anything. Um, it, just, it just makes them uh, see it, you know, with a kind of a different, different attitude. Uh, and there's also something about, about the trust of actually entrusting you know, fairly expensive research equipment uh, to, to children who then feel like you know, they're being entrusted with, with this gear and therefore you know, they, they take the project quite, quite seriously. Which you know, was, for me as a researcher, was quite a nerve-wracking uh, experience, especially because I couldn't get anyone to insure the equipment given the kind of places that I was going to. Uh, but you know, nothing happened to it you know, for, for months. Uh, so children are able to take care of it and, and ultimately make, uh, make short films, uh, which we then again would kind of discuss um, as um, you know, kind of their, um, their understandings of their environment and of the futures of the, of the environment. So here is a still from uh, one of the films that was made, uh, made in Utrecht, uh, where one of the students you know, is kind of walking along the river and is asking 
older people about the kind of past uh, of the area and, and how people lived and their relationship with the river. Um, which was really interesting, you know, when you, when you watch the entire film, uh, there are virtually no young people in it. There's only sort of older people, kind of above the age of 60 or so. Uh, and when I asked the, the children, you know, why, why that is, why did they choose to only talk to older people, um, they told me that it was because they, they felt, you know, that uh, the way that people were currently relating to the river and polluting the river uh, was, uh, was a problem and that they, they thought that maybe it was different in the past, right? That maybe there was a different way of relating to the river that they wanted to, um, you know, they wanted to explore. Um, so there was this kind of deliberate attempt at having an intergenerational dialogue uh, that they were engaging in, uh, which, which I found quite, quite interesting. Um, here's a still from the film that was made in, in South Africa. Uh, so the person we're looking at is called Desmond de Sa. And Desmond Deza is, a, is an internationally acclaimed environmental activist uh, who uh, is one of, the, one of the awardees of the Goldman Prize, which is considered the Nobel Prize in Environmental Protection. And the children actually sought him out, you know, he lives in the area, uh, and they wanted to do an interview with him, and they ended up spending a lot of time kind of following him and, and seeing, you know, how, how he goes about um, measuring air quality, you know, compiling reports about air pollution and ultimately then uh, feeding that information into environmental lawyers who were then challenging the, the breaches in, in courts. Um, and so they made this kind of a hopeful sort of documentary about uh, environmental activism in the, in the area. And even the film in, uh, that was made in, in Uttarakhand also had elements of, of that, elements of kind of activist imaginations uh, because as a rehabilitation site for Tehri Dam, there is a strong presence of activists who challenge uh, dam building and they challenge the particular sort of um, vision of, of modernist development that the Indian government has been pursuing since independence, you know, building these huge infrastructural projects, displacing hundreds of thousands of people. So you could see that also reflected in the, in the Indian film. And so ultimately, this, this sort of visual data and uh, Kind of ethnographic immersion in the in the field, then also led me to to start wondering about the link between activism and education. Um, and so the, the sort of next question um, that this this led to was you know thinking about the ways that activists' narratives and counter narratives um, might lead to a different kind of imagination of of the future, and ultimately how that might affect the young people in the community. So basically thinking of activism as a form of education, as a form of informal education, uh, and the ways that, you know, the, the kinds of depoliticized education that we might see in schools, and this idea of good environmental citizens that I talked about earlier, might actually be challenged and or complemented by these activist uh, narratives. Okay, so now this is where it gets, uh, you know, a little bit theoretical. So like I mentioned before, I was going to say a little bit about Hannah Arendt. Um, Hannah Arendt uh, is, I guess, most famous for theorizing totalitarian regimes in Europe in the 20th century, uh, specifically Nazism and Stalinism. She was very interested in how these regimes were uh, kind of enabled, right? W what was it that made it possible for this kind of unimaginable evil to, to basically emerge? Um, and one of, the, one of the ways that she approached this was through the notion of uh, bureaucratization. The idea that uh, human beings become bureaucratized, they are basically turned into these cogs in a machine where they no longer really have any kind of moral questioning, no, no longer really wonder about the kind of final consequence of their actions, but simply just agree to contribute to the larger machinery, kind of trusting that the machinery is going in the right, in the right direction. And as, as, a, as, a part, as part of that, that uh, Hannah Arendt talked about agonistic pluralism, uh, which is, you could say, the, almost the opposite of bureaucratization. Uh, the idea that we agonize over these difficult questions that we have to come together as, as a community to some kind of a conclusion about, we agonize about them because they are difficult questions, uh, and we do so in a kind of, in a kind of a pluralistic way. So, uh, you know, almost, almost like the sort of ancient Greek idea of uh, the agora or the, you know, the public square where people come together to, to agonize about these, these big questions. 
Um, and so she saw the engagement in agonistic pluralism as um, a way that we can prevent bureaucratization from, from happening, and that ultimately places where totalitarianism emerged didn't really have uh, you know, much, much agonistic pluralism in them at the time that it, that it happened. I mean, I'm, I'm greatly oversimplifying Hannah Arendt's theory because it would take me two hours to go through the you know, different steps, but that's basically the, the gist of it. Now, um, more contemporary scholars who have worked uh, with the ideas of Hannah Arendt have made a distinction between agonistic pluralism and um, deliberative democracy. The idea of deliberative democracy is that uh, there is basically uh, a um, consensus which is reached through some kind of a dialogue through the institutions within that democracy. Um, but the scholars who have studied this have pointed out that there is a contradiction uh, within deliberative democracy, that we somehow assume that uh, these institutions that facilitate this dialogue are neutral uh, and that they are actually going to enable us to resolve conflicts and different understandings. Uh, when in reality what we, what we see is that they tend to have a kind of depoliticizing effect, right? That they tend to actually erase the differences, erase the subjectivities, um, make people kind of want to express themselves in ways that are quite safe, uh, you know, where they don't challenge the status quo or rock the boat too much. Agonistic pluralism is ultimately a way of conducting politics which is um, conflictual, you could say, right? I mean, there are conflicts, there are different understandings that clash, that have to, that have to be worked out. Uh, thank you. I mean, Hannah, Hannah Arendt says that within the con confines of agonistic pluralism, what allows those conflicts to get resolved is the shared commitment uh, to the underlying ideas of democracy, that you know, if I believe that my opponent uh, is not my enemy, right, but they are, they are just my ideological opponent in the sense that they hold a different opinion, but we both have a commitment to democracy, then we are able to clash and we are able to, uh, to, you know, to have a conflict, uh, but remain within those, those democratic confines. Whereas the, the deliberative democracy tends to, uh, according to this strand of scholarship, tends to kind of tame that conflict, tends to sort of erase it. And so what I have picked up on with the activists that I, that I worked on, again, through kind of ethnographic engagement in these two places, the anti-pollution activists in South Africa and the anti dem activists in Uttarakhand, um, is that they tend to be much more on the side of agonistic pluralism than deliberative democracy. Uh, they tend to um, oftentimes bring the conflict out into the open, make it visible, uh, you know, really, really encourage that kind of uh, subjective expression and, uh, you know, this idea of challenging environmental futures um, you know, is very much at the core of, of, what, they, of what they do. Uh, so the idea you know, that we all work together and we all work towards a singular future, which might be seen within the, the context of deliberative democracy, doesn't exist in agonistic pluralism. In agonistic pluralism, we have multiple environmental futures that are competing, and we are trying to work out which ones or which elements from which one ultimately we will bring into, bring into being. Um, now, I've uh, made a distinction in the book between what I call horizontal and vertical agonistic pluralism. Uh, the idea of horizontal agonistic pluralism is that it is uh, kind of a, a debate or a conflict that is happening within a uh, generation. Uh, so it is the South African activists uh, where I think this is the most pronounced because these activists are dealing with legacies of, of, of apartheid, they're dealing with legacies of uh, racial exclusion, and they basically are, you know, within the current generation of people, uh, they are navigating very, very deep political differences. Uh, whereas the idea of vertical or intergenerational pluralism has to do with uh, the anti dem activists uh, who, in many cases, what they're trying to do is actually envision the perspectives of their elders who maybe are no longer alive, uh, who maybe, you know, have lived in the now submerged areas below the dam. Uh, who no longer are here to speak for themselves and speak for their visions of life, visions of development, visions of modernity, visions of uh, good life. And they're trying to imagine what they would say and bring that into the conversation. And therefore you end up with this kind of an intergenerational clash uh, where the activists are kind of speaking for the dead, you could say. Uh, so this idea of intergenerational and intragenerational 
of course, is not meant to be a dichotomy in the sense that one group of activists only does one and the other one only does the other. But I think you can you can kind of see how uh, these these pluralisms and these agonisms emerge differently in different places, and you know there might be more of a focus in one place on one one aspect than than the other. And ultimately, Hannah Arendt says that action, which means actually changing the world, uh, you know, doing something to change the world to make it different, is never possible in isolation. To be isolated is to be deprived of the capacity to act. Right. So to go back to the idea of a good environmental citizen uh, and the idea that you know we do these isolated micro actions. You know, I as an individual pick up a plastic bottle and I recycle it, or I as an individual pick up a sampling and put it into the ground and plant a tree that actually for meaningful action we need agonistic pluralism. Agonistic pluralism always happens in a group of people, it doesn't happen within an individual. And ultimately to be able to act, you know, we cannot do that in isolation. So if the education, if the formal education and the way that it approaches sustainability makes us more isolated, then from an Arendtian perspective, it's actually making it less likely that uh, we will ultimately be able to take action and do something new and something, something different. Okay, now in the last bit of this talk, I'm just going to share a few of the perspectives from activists, you know, when I actually ask them about what kind of an education would they like to see, uh, you know, what, what would be different in their vision of, of an education system. These are some of the, some of the responses that I, that I got. I don't think the school should be politically neutral. I think a school should make and take the policy decisions and have political opinions about time and place that it exists. So our government has signed the Paris Agreement. Does it mean that we close down coal mines and coal-fired stations in South Africa, or close down oil refineries? Actually, it does mean that, but our government has chosen to take decisions that don't immediately reflect those actions. But at the end of the day, they're going to have to do that. In one measure or another, we're going to have to decarbonize our economy. Is it out of place for a school to begin to express its own interpretation of what signing the Paris Accord might mean? I don't think so. If the vision that you are trying to shape the world is a vision that your country itself has already endorsed, that we have a vision that climate change is going to have the single biggest impact on our health and well-being as a country, then surely a school should be able to interpret that and express that. So what I think is quite interesting here is that you know, this in, in, in many ways is not particularly radical, what this person is saying, right? I mean, this person is basically simply just saying, we've got these existing frameworks, and you know, the school maybe has a role in thinking about how to interpret those frameworks, how to put them into action, but you know, we don't even necessarily have to go outside of those frameworks, right? Uh, we can just think of ourselves as almost like putting up a mirror to society. And, uh, you know, I think that goes back to the idea of agonistic pluralism, that, you know, maybe this particular person doesn't agree with how the South African government is approaching the implementation of the Paris Agreement, but um, they are still committed to the underlying basis of democratic deliberation, right? They're not saying we should kick out the government, replace the government, or we should sign a more radical agreement. They're simply just saying, you know, we've got this framework in place, now let's, let's debate how to, how to actually turn it into something material. So they're, you know, very much from an Arendtian perspective remaining within that, that uh, space where they are entering a conflict with the government, but they are not entering a conflict where they see the government as an enemy. They simply see the government as a, as a kind of intellectual uh, antagonist, which is, I suppose, in an Arendtian sense, very, very different. Okay, let's look at another one. Um, we need an education system that does not punish those who have a commitment to their society and are not necessarily obsessed with self-advancement. The question to be asked is whether making someone a decent human being is politicizing them, you know. They should actually just be mindful that, look, you cohabit the world and I should be mindful of the impact of my actions. I mean, if you take that elementary kind of level, then you will have people that think that it is important to be mindful of our impact on the environment, right? You know, the point about it is that education represents the common investment of society's young people. See, it is not an economic investment, it's a moral investment, it's a philosophical investment, it's an investment in the ethos of that society. So again, you could say this person isn't really saying anything that revolutionary, but when we look at the policy frameworks, when we look at the SDGs and a lot of the policies that are built on the SDGs, we don't really see uh, ideas like moral investment or philosophical investment. We see ideas like economic investment and human capital. Uh, so I think even though this might sound like it's common sense, actually that common sense doesn't necessarily appear in, in a lot of the policy documents that we see in, in many countries um, around the world. So once again, you know, not, not something that's very radical, but something that is clearly different from what is actually happening. Finally, one more perspective. And the catalytic issue here is social action. 
I mean, being a transformative agent is not, as some people put it, it's not an act of contemplation. You know, you don't imagine yourself like that. You have to be moved to action. And it is when you act that you have to ask the question, but why am I active? And once that kind of process is set in motion, the education's impact is dramatic because suddenly you're open to making sense of the impulses. So this, this person is, is questioning the kind of cognitive focus of education, right? That we tend to think of education as a process where we engage our rational thoughts, uh, you know, we contemplate, we come to a conclusion, we decide that we're going to do something and then we do it. This person is saying, well, actually, in reality, that's not necessarily how humans operate, right? Humans are emotional beings. We are driven by emotional impulses. Uh, an emotional impulse to protect the environment, for example, doesn't necessarily have to make sense on the rational level. Maybe we are just moved in the direction of, of that action. Um, we take that action, and then the education can actually help us reflect afterwards about why was that impulse there in the first place? Why did we have this, this emotion, kind of making sense of it after the fact? So really turning, turning kind of the model of education that we currently have uh, on, its, on its head in, in some ways. Okay, uh, I am almost at, out of time and I'm also almost at the end of the presentation. So let me just summarize a few, a few things. Okay, great. So I'd just like to say a few things that are maybe a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit more kind of policy focused or you know, oriented towards, towards kind of the, the, the practice because a lot of what I was talking about was quite, quite theoretical. Um, so to my mind, one of the lessons of this research is that uh, educating for the Anthropocene means going beyond schooling. That education in the Anthropocene is not just about schooling, it is about also alternative spaces of education, alternative spaces of knowledge exchange, of intergenerational dialogue. And what, what does that mean for how we actually practice education within, within the formal system? What kinds of changes uh, might, might we need uh, in the formal system to kind of keep up with the Anthropocene? So one is localization of curricula, right? Uh, so we have this, this trend of neoliberal globalization where curricula are actually converging, um, but arguably uh, that doesn't necessarily help us when it comes to environmental issues because uh, a lot of environmental issues are local, uh, right? I mean, climate change might be a global issue, but it is driven by a myriad of things that are happening at the local level. So if we can't think of those issues, uh, we are unlikely to solve climate change. It also means um, giving more agency to teachers. I think in, in a lot of the, the kind of global policy discourse around education that we currently see, uh, if anything, you know, uh, the, the agency that is given to teachers is limited, right? It's shrinking. Uh, you know, we see teachers as basically these agents that deliver uh, an education that someone else has designed rather than, you know, autonomous human beings who actually might be responding to what is happening in their local environments and uh, modeling that response for their, for their students. That is also linked to this idea of bureaucratization, so really trying to de-bureaucratize the teachers, right? Rather than kind of trying to trying to throw more paperwork, you know, and more uh, and more and more kind of standardized uh, processes, which um, ultimately might have the effect of, as I was talking about earlier with Hannah Arendt's theory of bureaucratization, might have the effect of bureaucratizing people, of making them. Uh, not really think about the real kind of consequences, moral, ethical consequences of their actions, uh, right? You know, if you, if you reduce teaching to, or education to a set of uh, tick boxes that people have to tick, then it becomes quite easy to, to, you know, kind of become bureaucratized, you know, within, within that framework and not really think about what is the larger goal here? What is the larger purpose of this, of this process? I think there's also something to be said about um, the barriers that might exist between activists and educators. Uh, this book very much calls for bridging activism with education and uh, really also for maybe the, this kind of merging of identities as well, right? You know, that right now we tend to think of activists as a kind of separate category and teachers or educators as, as a different category. But even in the course of this research, you'll find if, if you look at the book when it comes out, there's a section on what I call outlier teachers who are basically teacher activists, you know, so people who are operating within the formal education system, but who are very much pushing the boundaries and challenging, uh, challenging those, those um, decisions that are being made uh, about you know, how, how the education should be delivered. Uh, so I think there's something to be said about, about building those bridges and thinking about you know, how can we encourage educational activism and activist education, right? I think those are quite, quite interesting uh, spaces to look at. And also specifically, there are um, uh, experiments that are happening within education that we could look at as models for, for some of this. 
Um, I actually did a small study, which is didn't actually make it into the book because I haven't haven't had, yet had, had a chance to kind of write it up. But hopefully, it'll come out as a separate article later. Um, in uh, a group of schools, schools that call themselves that call themselves uh, Jivanshalas, they're schools that are run by uh, the, the Narmada Bacha Andalan, the Save the Narmada movement uh, in the Narmada Valley in, in Madhya Pradesh. And you know, these are these are schools which are designed uh, for local people. Partly because there are no government schools, so they're filling a gap. Uh, but they're also very much run and designed by activists. Uh, so there is a kind of activist pedagogy and a kind of activist curriculum, uh, you know, which I, I found personally really fascinating when I when I had a chance to spend some time there. Uh, so I think looking at those kinds of experiments and maybe giving them a bit more attention in the discourse, uh, I think could also help shift the conversation uh, uh, a little bit. Now, again, zooming out a little bit more towards the conceptual. Uh, so conceptually, what does educating for the Anthropocene mean? Well, I think it means, first of all, recognizing the Anthropocene and its implications. Uh, so you know, trying to think you know, in, in terms of deep time, not just the kind of shallow human time. Uh, trying to think about the notion of planetary boundaries uh, and really thinking about the idea of stewardship of, of the planet. Uh, you know, so these are quite you know, deep sort of philosophical concepts, but I think it is one of the jobs of education to take deep philosophical concepts and translate them into practice. So I think there's, there's a sort of challenge here for education to, to wrestle with these ideas and, and figure out ways uh, to actually incorporate them in, in the way that we approach education. I think we need to return to a radical definition of sustainability, right? I mean, in the, the word radical oftentimes is, is, is sort of uh, viewed as meaning extreme, but I think Radical, again, if you go to the root of the, of the word, the, the root of the word radical is root, right? So simply just returning to the roots of sustainability, uh, and when you look at you know, the way the word was used in the 60s and in the 70s, especially when the environmental movement really sort of first took off internationally, it had, a much, more, uh, it had much more teeth as a word, right? I mean, it, it really wasn't about the sustainability of the economic system, of capitalism, of extraction or infinite growth. It was actually about a long-term survival of humanity and long-term survival of other species as well, uh, which is not necessarily the way we use sustainability right now. If you look at you know, how sustainability is used within the SDGs, for example, it is very clear that the economic is, is much more prioritized over the environmental. Historical responsibility, political imagination, and action, right? So those are the kind of Arendtian concepts uh, that I was talking about earlier, I guess I could add. Uh, agonistic pluralism to the list, um, really thinking about uh, you know, how do we actually educate for action, right? Action in an Arendtian sense, I think requires all of, these, all of these components. And I am just going to conclude with this drawing. Uh, those of you who were here on Thursday for the, for the workshop, you would have seen this picture before. So this is just an attempt, which was done in, a, in collaboration with a friend of mine who, who is an artist. Uh, to try and actually take some of these quite abstract, difficult ideas and put them into something that is actually quite accessible and, and in some ways very simple to, to wrap, wrap one's head around. Uh, so this is basically the idea of a kind of a model of educating for the Anthropocene, which is based on some of these activist ideas, uh, which boils down to these four verbs, grasp, care, imagine, and communicate. The grasping, you know, grasping what is at stake, caring, so the emotional impulse that the activist was talking about earlier, um, not, not a rational thought, but an emotional emotional impulse. Linked to the imagination, imagination of alternative futures, and then the ability to communicate that imagination to others. And as you can see, it's, it's a circle. So uh, after I've had a chance to communicate my ideas about the future to someone else, and listen to someone else communicate their ideas, maybe that's going to change how I'm thinking about what it is that I'm grasping. I might grasp something new or something different, and that might change how I feel, and it might change how I imagine the future. So you know, it's kind of iterative iterative cycle uh, of um, you know, really kind of relying on uh, the, the kind of innate human ability to be creative in the imagination of alternative futures and harnessing that, uh, that impulse. Uh, in some ways, you know, this is not meant to be anything that is imposed on, on people. You know, this is meant to be something that is uh, actually very much simply just reflective of who we are as, as humans. I think all of these four verbs, grasping, caring, imagining, communicating, they, they come to us naturally. Uh, and so the whole idea really is just to, just to build on that uh, and to harness and, and kind of deepen that rather than impose anything new or anything, anything different. 
so I guess that would be the kind of hopeful note, you know, that I would like to leave this on, which is that in some ways we actually do have all of the ingredients uh, for educating for the Anthropocene. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, we don't have to do anything, you know, crazy or, or difficult. We just, uh, in some ways, have to do what we, what we already do as, as humans and maybe just, just do more of it and maybe do it better. Okay, I think I'm just about out of time anyways.